crianças brincando, crianças subindo, crianças sendo crianças. Ah, como crianças brincando, crianças subindo, crianças balanceiam. Welcome to today's seminar, Gender Considerations in Mobile Health Data Collection. This is the fourth in our seven-part series on gender foundations and health data. For those of you who do not know me, I am Dr. Michelle Kaufman, the lead for the Gender Equity Unit of the Data for Health Initiative. I hope you enjoyed our musical selections today by female artists from South Africa, Algeria, Poland, and Portugal. Today's panelists are pioneers in mobile and digital health. Many were inspired to use mobile technology to advance global public health during the early days of the M Health Summit, which launched in 2009. They have been supporting community work, health workers to use mobile phones in the field, improving maternal and child health using mobile technology, and supporting innovations in the field in more than 50 countries for the world's hardest to reach populations. One goal of the Data for Health initiative is to find affordable, scalable solutions, such as mobile technology, to conduct cost-effective collection of non-communicable disease risk factor data. This includes integrating gender equity into our NCD mobile work in deep and meaningful ways to ensure that gender data gaps are addressed in these new forms of data collection. This blending of gender equity and technology is especially timely considering the recent International Women's Day and here in the US, Women's History Month celebrations. Technology has no geographic boundaries. So now is the time to include women in our mobile health data efforts as an imperative to improve the health and wellness of both women and girls, as well as non-binary people around the globe. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this session, June Sugiyama, the director of the Vodafone's, Vodafone Americas Foundation. June has been in the corporate philanthropy sector for over 20 years, specializing in identifying the power of technology for social good. She has led the foundation's transition towards empowering women and girls through technology aligning programs with Vodafone's expertise in technology and innovation. June developed the foundation's wireless innovation project, a competition designed to seek the best wireless technology to address critical global issues. Several winners of this challenge are already impacting over 65 million lives by addressing poverty, health, of the environment, disaster relief, and technology access. June's background hails from education, specifically elementary, bilingual, and special education. She received her teaching credential and liberal studies degree from San Francisco State University and has pending master's and specialist credentials from the University of San Francisco. June, welcome. It's so nice to have you here today. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman. Good morning from California and greetings to all those that are joining us from all corners of the world. Um, when my dear friend Deb Levine asked me to be part of this panel, I was a little bit intimidated to be amongst such great esteemed leaders and practitioners. But although I'm dating myself, I did witness the birth of mobile. So I'm very proud and happy to be here today. The agenda for the seminar will follow the traditional format. Uh, we'll be hearing from each of our panelists in turn, beginning with Dr. Krishna Jaffa, the new CEO of Medic, an organization that's near and dear to my heart and uh, something I all also witnessed the birth of, who will represent an overview of the status of gender equity in mobile health data collection. Then uh, Dr. Alain Labrique will provide insight in improving women and girls' maternal health using mobile data collection over the course of multi-year project in Bangladesh. Finally, we'll hear from Dr. Divya Nair, who will then share samples, examples of mobile health data collection done in India 
with a gendered lens and provide tips for the field. After these present presentations, I will host a discussion with the panelists where they can answer questions already submitted by data for health partners working in mobile health. So let's get started by introducing Dr. Krishna Jaffa. Now, um, you have to excuse me, I have to read these bios because uh, the panelists are so accomplished. The, um, their resumes are very, very long. So Dr. Jaffa joined Medic in 2022 and serves as Chief Executive Officer based remotely in Seattle, USA. She leads the organization to build the Community Health Toolkit Community of Practice, enable users and partners to design and deliver high impact apps for their health systems and nurture their team and culture. Dr. Jaffa previously held key leadership roles at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Population Services International, and the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention. A physician, epidemiologist, and public health executive, she brings deep expertise in health systems, strengthening digital health innovation, and in building and steering global partnerships and teams towards achieving universal healthcare. A deeply committed advocate for women's and girls' empowerment, health, and reproductive rights, Dr. Jaffa holds an MD from Rajasthan University in India, an MPH from Harvard University, is an alumna of CDC's Epidemic Intelligence Service, and serves as an advisory council member of the Last Mile Health. Welcome, Dr. Jaffa. You have eight minutes. Thank you, June. And I'll edit my bio down for the next time I do this. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to uh, be uh, joining uh, this, this wonderful panel and hope everyone can hear me okay. If not, June, please let me know. Um, and my topic is strengthening gender data and measures in health via digital tools. So I'm going to set the scene that hopefully will complement um, what my colleagues are going to share. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so just to give you a broad overview of what we mean when we talk about gender data, uh, I think it helps to define what data we need, uh, understanding where the gaps are, what to collect and why. So, um, at a minimum, the kinds of data that we need, and you can see this in the schematic on, on this uh, slide, um, is to improve the availability of sex disaggregated data. At a minimum, that is something that I think we should all uh, aspire to, and I think that is a fairly achievable goal. And yet, there's a massive dearth of sex disaggregated data. Um, it is often collected, it is not regularly analyzed, and it is rarely used for decision making. Um, in addition to sex disaggregated data, uh, we can also look at intersectional data. So that is where you collect information on age, occupation, uh, perhaps socioeconomic status, uh, race in, in, in countries that, that uh, have historically had racial disparities and access to health and so on. And that is basically what intersectionality means. Um, and the third bucket that, that I think is, is really exciting for us in this day and age is uh, increased use of non-traditional gender data. So this is what's generated through media, social media, et cetera. Um, and then briefly, how, how, how do we sustain progress for us to collectively continue to expand gender data availability, access, and use, and to importantly, adequately resource and support data infrastructures and production to do this. Um, I've provided a link uh, to the paper I co-authored, a white paper I co-authored with uh, colleagues that you see to the left-hand side of the screen. And if you'd like a little bit more detail about uh, any of these concepts, uh, please click on the link. Next slide, please. Uh, before we jump into solving for data, I think we also do really need to keep in mind that the digital gender divide is very real. It is getting better over time, but uh, there is still a 15% gender gap in mobile internet use, and there is a 7% gender gap in mobile ownership. If you look at the differential between smartphones and, and feature phones, 
uh, you also begin to see some really interesting socioeconomic <clears throat> differences. Um, and while uh, smartphones are becoming cheaper, more pervasive, more accessible, and lend themselves to um, additional uses, we also need to factor in the reality that I'm sure most of us have experienced of being somewhere, including Seattle, interestingly, where <laughs> your internet cuts out from time to time and it's, it's almost impossible to connect to a network. Next slide, please. Uh, that said, the health sector is getting better at recognizing the importance of gender responsive approaches, and this is uh, these these two visuals are from the Global Health 5050 2021 report, uh, flying blind in the time of crisis. And again, if you haven't had a chance to look at this, I would encourage you to look at it. Uh, and on the top left hand side of the slide, you can see that more organizations are publishing gender responsive health approaches, and by gender responsive. It is a continuum uh, moving from gender blind to being gender sensitive and acknowledging gender norms, roles, and relations, uh, but not actually developing any remedial action. That's probably a bucket in which many organizations sit to becoming gender specific and really considering how gender norms affect access to resources and intentionally targeting women or men to meet specific needs. And then to gender transformative, which is really addressing the causal reasons for why we have um, gender-based health inequities. <clears throat> and so the approach is there, but it still lags in translating this intent into action, including for gender data. And I think that's a really important uh, difference to note. And when you look at translating into action, only 39% of organizations that were included in, in a recent uh, survey we're actually publishing sex disaggregated programmatic data. And there's a breakdown that you can see that I won't go through of the types of organizations that sex disaggregate by um, programmatic data and the UN system um, is, is leading uh, because they I understand mandate the collection of and use of such data. Next slide, please. So moving to the so what for digital health, uh, I think uh, a key and important part of, of, of how we need to look at it is to resolutely use user-centered approaches and intersectoral, i.e. health, gender, and digital approaches to make digital tools work for humans and for health systems, and through that to be able to achieve at least the collection of data and ultimately the an analysis and use to inform um, health programs. Um, and the way we look at this at MEDIC is first, what our community desires. As you know, about 70% of uh, frontline health forces are female. So what is the human value to them? The second question we ask is, what is an organization or a system, including a data system, able to sustain and scale? And this varies. And the third is, what is the feasibility? So what technical constraints and affordances do we need to consider? So these are central to then looking at user-centered design and how we apply it at MEDIC. Uh, to collect data uh, largely by women, and we do sex disaggregate and data collection. Um, and as we develop these tools, really going through a user-centered design continuum from discovery all the way through to testing and refinement. Next slide, please. So if you, we are thinking about integrating gender data and if we are thinking about uh, thoughtfully applying user-centered design, then we should be getting to appropriately designed and deployed um, digital tools that can improve quality and timeliness of care, productivity, and cost effectiveness. And as you do this, you can and should be able to get to where you're able to improve design. You're also able to get to uh, improved community case management, which if you extrapolate it to a point where you are collecting and analyzing sex disaggregated data, you can and should be able to say whether or not there are any gender differentials in, in such care. And this is a collaboration that Medic has with Musso, which has shown that uh, household visits can increase and uh, coverage can increase, which are both important sort of equity measures. Um, if you make uh, minor tweaks to the workflow and to the usability of, of a given digital um, interface. Um, next slide, please. Um, 
I think just, just in, in, in closing, there are a number of opportunities to integrate gender responsiveness and gender analysis and digital data solutions for health. First and foremost, start analyzing and using what is collected today. Every time I come across sort of an organization that is collecting sex disaggregated data and I ask the question, do you use these data? The frequent answer I hear is not really. And I think that's as true for Medic as we try and do better as it is for other organizations. Um, investing in interoperability uh, is incredibly important. Uh, pairing interoperability with ethical data governance is something that we at Medic are paying a great deal of, of attention to responsible data, responsible data collection, as well as data integrity as the other side of, of ethical data collection and use. And importantly, looking at non-traditional data sources, which can, as the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us, be rapidly and repeatedly collected to reduce data gaps, uh, be they via social and news media, geospatial and other mobile device generated data, and internet news, as well as private sector data that are available to us. Next slide, please. So with that, I will end. I hope I've come in at or close to my eight minutes and pass it back to June. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Jaffa, for laying the foundation for the seminar and showcasing the gender gaps of mobile data collection. We've really learned a lot from you. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Alain Labrique. Dr. Labrique is the founding director of Johns Hopkins University Global M Health In Initiative, an infectious disease and population epidemiologist and serves as professor and the inaugural associate chair for research in Department of International Health. Dr. Labrique leads research, research in maternal, neonatal, and infant health in resource limited settings and was recognized as one of the top 11 M Health innovators in 2011. He served as a lead author on the 2012 Bellagio Declaration on M Health Evidence. He has authored over 150 publications in high impact journals, as well as many book chapters and technical reports. His framework for digital health remains among the most cited. Dr. Labrique serves as the technical advisor to several international and global health agencies and ministries of health, and is the chair of the WHO Digital Health Guidelines Development Group and a member of the WHO Digital Health Rosters of Experts. Welcome, Dr. Labrique. You have eight minutes. Thank you <clears throat> so much, June, for that very generous introduction. I think I, I too have to work on shortening that. Um, but thanks for the opportunity to share some of our perspectives on this uh, important uh, issue. From over 20 years working with community health workers on strengthening women's health in rural South Asia. Uh, next slide. So we've all been, oh, I think we jumped ahead a few slides here. But uh, anyway, I'm just gonna keep going here. Um, we've all been witnesses to a mobile revolution which disproportionately has seen immense transformations in the communication landscape of South Asia and Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. Um, this for our work in reducing maternal and neonatal mortality was an interesting overlap uh, leading us to ask the question, whether phones could help address the persistent care and coverage gaps that we were seeing. When we began working on these projects in the early 2010s, uh, many important digital gender gaps had been identified by groups such as USAID and M Women, ranging from technical literacy to SMS and phone literacy, as well as access to electricity. Working with a research team of about 850 staff, mostly women, we began to unravel some of these opportunities we were seeing in rural Bangladesh. Next slide. Already in 2007, we started to see cell phone towers pop up around our study site uh, like mushrooms, uh, with phone ownership doubling to 45% in just the first three years of our studying this, uh, this issue. Uh, this was just a few years after we were considering investing in carrier pigeons because of the absence of reliable communication channels, even copper-based landline systems. Next slide. 
This was happening against a backdrop of high maternal and neonatal mortality that continues to decline each year, but still is at an unacceptably high rate of over 150 neonates dying each day. Next slide. We studied phone use systematically as part of a near miss study, learning from women who nearly died in childbirth, finding that half of near misses between 2007 and 10 used a phone during the obstetric crisis for a range of support services, mainly to call a provider or get medical advice. Next slide. This gave us the courage to try and see if we could use cell phone based labor notification to be able to get a skilled team to the home during or shortly after delivery. The answer was an overwhelming yes. 89% of births were successfully attended. Next slide. But important challenges had to be considered when introducing mobile phone based interventions in rural communities, including the role of gatekeepers like mothers in laws and husbands. Next slide. As we worked with government frontline health workers, we found a clear need to address pain points, which these mostly female frontline workers were facing from excessive workloads that were causing stress to paperwork burdens, requiring them to work long unpaid hours to complete reports and this excessive paperwork. This in addition to, next uh, box, the physical stress of paper-based systems they were carrying around, adding physical pain to their psychological distress. For example, one worker explains how the five kilograms of paper that they were carrying around for hours walking from home to home hurt their backs and shoulders as they completed their daily tasks. Next slide. We worked with a local software entrepreneur company, Empower, to develop this system that we called Open Smart Register Platform based on intense co-creation with the female community health workers through human-centered design approaches shadowing them to understand their actual workflows and extensively pre-testing the system to stabilize its performance and usability. Next slide. We learned a great deal from studying almost 125,000 household enrollment visits, almost 16,000 pregnancies and 14,000 live-born infants. Next slide. What was fascinating was to see women's literacy has just improved dramatically over the decades, with over 80% in both of the arms of this study far outpacing their husband's literacy. In this rural remote community of northern Bangladesh, nearly 95% of homes reported owning a phone, 50% of the time it being in the hands of the pregnant woman. Most women reported being able to receive and answer calls but there remained a persistent gap in their reported ability to read and write text messages, which they relied on younger members of their households to help with. Next slide. We found that providing female community health workers with this enabling technology reduced perinatal mortality by 20%, a unique finding in the space of digital health. Next slide. But given the short time we have together, I'm just gonna focus on a few key messages First, that access doesn't require ownership. Given the widespread availability of phones as a service through local community stores like this one, uh, women were able to make phone calls and receive messages through local phone agents located in convenience stores throughout their communities. Next slide. The challenge of access to electricity has been increasingly chipped away over the past several years with the introduction first of large car batteries that provided points of charging for phones, now migrating to low cost solar rooftop panels that are ubiquitous across the Bangladeshi countryside. Next slide. The importance of user-centered design cannot be understated given that the end user in this case, female frontline health workers had to be at the core of what we were doing Despite a lot of pressure from policymakers and supervisors about design expectations that they had, we insisted that women be in the driver's seat when it came to how the system looked, felt, and worked. Next slide. 
Setting up communities of practice was critical for women to find support in each other's successes in a non-threatening, culturally appropriate way. Next slide. Despite a long and steep learning curve, aptitude and eagerness to use the technology in our experience was high, irrespective of age and prior technical experience. Almost all the workers had never used a touchscreen phone prior to receiving the tablet for this work. Next slide. There are a few universal considerations we felt important to keep in mind beyond the learning curve including recognizing a dual burden of work using paper and digital systems simultaneously, requirements for robust technical support, understanding the frustrations of poor connectivity, remaining flexible to the needs of clients who are attending to their household demands, potentially extending interview time while childcare or household activities were being attended to. Digital, we recognize, can also be seen as an opportunity to add more and more to community health workloads, potentially overflowing an already full plate. Finally, digital systems can also increase the granularity of supervision. Knowing where a worker is at all times using a digital tool can lead to a loss of privacy and autonomy that frontline health workers previously enjoyed. Next slide. Many of these reflections have been captured in this outstanding piece from Dr. Asha George and her colleagues who point out that digital can work in many positive ways to enhance frontline workers, many of whom are women around the globe. However, there's no one size fits all formula requiring us to have constant vigilance, reflection, and consideration of gender issues that might be provoked or neglected by digital health. Next slide. That said, we're thrilled to report that this OpenSRP platform is now successfully scaled in over 20 countries, being used by 30,000 workers, mostly women, benefiting over 100 million people around the globe. Next slide. We've learned a lot about including women in digital health implementations, but recognize that we have miles to go to achieve equity and gender balance. I appreciate the time this morning and I look forward to our discussion together. Thank you, Dr. Labrique. That was incredible and eye-opening to hear about the challenges and successes of your work in Bangladesh in maternal and child health. Um, just as a reminder, we'll be addressing uh, uh, questions that the audience might have after the panelist discussion. So uh, please feel free to submit your um, questions in the chat. I'd like to introduce you to the next speaker, Dr. Divya Nair. Uh, Dr. Nair is a senior director of ID Insight based in New Delhi. ID Insight is a mission-driven global advisory, data analytics, and research organization that helps development leaders maximize their social impact. Dr. Nair has worked with governments, multilaterals, and NGOs for 15 years. She leads teams to identify key challenges and design and execute high quality, demand-driven analytical services so that clients can improve their social impact. Service offerings range from large-scale surveys, policy analysis, process evaluations, setting up monitoring systems to applying machine learning and executing RCTs. Dr. Nair is deeply invested in addressing topics around health and nutrition and women and girls empowerment, and has also worked on financial inclusion, sanitation and agriculture. She has a PhD in public health and economics from Johns Hopkins University. Welcome Dr. Nair. You have eight minutes. Hi, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here um, and uh, really listening to the speakers uh, before me. Uh, you know, a lot of what they said uh, resonated. We have actually also been working with frontline workers in Bangladesh. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been amazing to see basically the, as June was saying, uh, you know, the, the, potential and the possibilities of mobile health and mobile technology. And, um, you know, I, in today's talk, I'm going to be talking a little bit about phone surveys, 
but um, you know, as uh, June mentioned, we have been working in terms of setting up monitoring systems for frontline workers, helping train them um, in terms of how to enter the data into these phone surveys, use the data, because very often, you know, the challenge is that they um, they don't actually interact with the data that they're collecting. So all of what you know has uh, kind of preceded me really resonates. Um, I look forward to a you know a lively conversation after this too. A next slide, please. So just to give you a quick um, you know overview of what ID Insight does, I think it was there in, in the introduction. Uh, next slide. Uh, we are laser focused on impact, and the way we define impact is. Uh, you know, the decisions made and the actions that we can support to actually improve lives. So um, many of us work very closely with government. So I work uh, with the Indian government. Uh, we have offices, uh, we have seven offices, including in uh, Rabat, uh, Lusaka, uh, Nairobi, and I'm based in the New Delhi office. We also have an office in Manila. And a lot of our work is directly with government and kind of supporting them to make evidence-based decisions. And so we are agnostic in terms of the tools we use. Um, and in this case today, I'm going to be talking about the survey capabilities that we have deployed and the learnings that we have uh, you know, received, uh, especially during the COVID pandemic. So that's what we mean by tailored engagements is, uh, uh, you know, the services that we provide are very tailored according to the needs of the client. Um, and we really try to be innovative and, you know, hope that we are agile, but rigorous and client driven as we provide this evidence for decision making. Uh, next slide. So uh, for, uh, you know, as the pandemic uh, started, ID Insight kind of deployed its uh, phone capability uh, infrastructure. We have an infrastructure called Data on Demand, where in India we have about a thousand surveyors across the country who were collecting in-person data before the pandemic. And we have you know, systems in place to be able to kind of ensure that the quality of this data is good and that uh, you know, we are able to analyze it quickly. So for example, the first survey that we conducted was with the national government and we were able to turn around the data in 10 days uh, across 6,000 households in nine states. So you know, it, it's really rapid data to give a sense of what was happening in the country. Uh, and we basically conducted around eight of these surveys um, that uh, were focused on rural households. And the topics ranged from COVID knowledge uh, and attitudes, getting a sense of where the public services were reaching uh, households. And also we looked at uh, women's digital literacy and uh, there was some uh, focus on women's experience as part of being self-help groups, uh, members of self-help groups, because that was a kind of resilience mechanism for many households as the self-help group movement kind of is taking, um, you know, is energizing across India. And, uh, you know, uh, we were basically, uh, in many cases, uh, reconnecting with households who we had connected with in person, and now we were calling them, so we had phone numbers um, from pre-COVID uh, times. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, after, uh, during and uh, after the uh, data collection happened, we were looking at very, you know, uh, consciously uh, uh, targeting women. And one of the things that we found was that 70% um, of the time when we called a household, despite very high uh, mobile access in India, uh, men picked up the phone. So, so just stepping back a little bit on this slide is uh, around 90% of households in India do own phones. And I think one key takeaway from my presentation, I hope, is that you know, there's a big difference between phone ownership, access, and use. And ownership is very high in India. Access and use are low, specifically for women. And so in this case, uh, you know, what happens is uh, phones are collectively owned by a household and the man often takes the phone with him to his job, uh, to, his, to where he works. And uh, the woman is often not around and so she doesn't have access to the phone. So if we just 
a cold called a household, we were able to get women only 21 to 30 percent, 21 to 40 percent of the time. Um, next slide, please. And you know the gap in between was that what we found was only 10%, uh, can you click once more? Only 10% of the time was a person willing to pass the phone on to whoever else was with them. So basically the, the challenge is that, you know, because women don't have access to the phone, the, their use of the phone is very low. And uh, whether it was a man or woman, because they're not co-located during the day, often th this phone pass rate was extremely low. Uh, next slide. Uh, and also when we asked households about use of phones, we found that, as you can see, this is within the same household, there was a big gap in phone use. So daily use among men, as you can see, is around three out of four men were using the household daily, whereas only 46% of women were using the, house, the phone uh, daily within the household. And most women, are, uh, around one third of women were using the phone only for emergencies. So, you know, this kind of gives you a sense of the lack of use of phones uh, among women within rural households in India. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, just, uh, I want to mention one thing is that in the previous slide, we also looked at households which had multiple phones and it actually didn't change much in terms of use. So basically when multiple phones came into the household, it was still the man that was using the, uh, the phone and uh, the, the women were not accessing it. Uh, I'll rush through this slide, but basically, um, you know, we tried these two strategies. We tried this light gender targeting where we would cold call uh, a household, but we, where we had planned that it would be a male respondent household or a female respondent household. And what we found is, as I mentioned earlier, very low response rates from women, because often the, man, the woman was not able to get the phone from the man. Ne uh, next, please. What we uh, found actually did work was to have proactive appointments. So it was not that the man didn't want to give the phone to the woman, but what happened was that if we had an appointment with, uh, with the woman a priori, then we were actually able to reach the woman and our, our pass rate increased substantially. Uh, next slide. And uh, all of this is now uh, the previous work that uh, I was speaking about is published in a, a BMJ article that I believe Deb has put on. Uh, so you could also look at that in terms of, you know, really going through what the challenges are. Before kind of signing off, I do want to kind of uh, to highlight that our experience was peculiar. It is rural women in India who have particularly difficult barriers to, uh, to cross in terms of the social norms that are around them. It is very difficult for them to access and use the phone. Uh, as you can see in South Asia, we've uh, done phone surveys uh, globally. In South Asia, women were 19% less likely to own mobile phones. Whereas in East Asia, in the Philippines, for example, that difference was really very small. In sub-Saharan Africa, there was variation. In Ghana and in Kenya, we did not actually find a difference in gender in terms of who answered the phone. Whereas in Nigeria, there was a difference and it was usually men who answered the phone. So that's something to keep in mind is that there is this variation uh, within countries and, and across countries. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of getting access, direct access to the woman, I think, you know, some of our learnings were that you have to really kind of keep in mind the context of the person you're calling. So if they are farmers, the agricultural season is important. Uh, women's work schedule and, uh, you know, differs from men's work schedule. And so really kind of understanding who your respondent is and tailoring the time at which you call is important. Uh, next, just if you could click through. Uh, and so appointments really improved, uh, you know, based on what time worked for, for these female respondents, it was important to, uh, to call back according to what worked for them. Next. And another uh, learning for us was that female surveyors really increased consent rate. Uh, and this uh, worked across a lot of geographies. Basically, in India, what we found in rural India was that, you know, some uh, man who was unknown calling 
uh, generally uh, it was very difficult for that person to reach a female respondent and women were just generally uh, able to kind of reach female uh, respondents much uh, easier basically the rate was 14 percentage points higher in india and regardless of whether it's a male or a female we do recommend gender sensitivity training for all surveyors um, and you know we think it's it's really essential going forward another thing to keep in mind is that the survey industry is actually very male dominated and so we've been investing quite a bit in terms of training female surveyors because when we tried to recruit more female surveyors they were less experienced often and uh, you know really investing in more female surveyors was uh, is essential and hopefully as a community we can do that next slide um, and yes, building trust, you know, going back to, uh, you know, just having the female surveyors, but building trust is very important, especially when you're calling on a phone, you need to explain where you got the phone number from, who you are. Consent is extremely important in terms of making sure that they really understand, uh, you know, that they, they can opt out of this. And uh, Another finding on in terms of phone surveys, as phone surveys has been that, you know, you really don't know what's happening on the other side. And so you have to be very sensitive in terms of being open to, uh, to you know, be, basically, for example, being on a phone speaker. In India, uh, a study found that a lot of uh, respondents were actually uh, uh, on phone speakers. And so that's why you could not ask them very private, con uh, uh, you could not cover very private topics. And so you have to be careful about that. Next slide. And so uh, wrapping up, I just uh, kind of uh, highlight a few points. One is that the context of the respondent is really important um, in terms of you know, the, their geography, as I mentioned, but also their occupation, age, um, socioeconomic status. Ensuring privacy is really important. Uh, as I said, you know, this, it's very difficult actually if you're calling to know whether they're on a speaker phone or not but uh, you can ask and you know, see. Uh, and also then you have to be careful about the kinds of questions that you can uh, ask using mobile phones. Uh, keeping it short and simple is important, but you know, what we have seen is building a rapport ensures that you can actually increase the length of these surveys. And finally, um, you know, provide, making sure that you use the data, that the data is gen gender disaggregated, that it actually helps these respondents uh, and sharing the insights back to the respondents, if you can, I think that would be really powerful because a lot of these, again, for us, this was during COVID, giving them insights on what was happening in their community would be very helpful and, um, you know, really kind of empowering them with that information uh, is useful. Uh, I will stop there and open to questions after this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nair. Clearly, um, we have a lot to learn from the experiences that ID Insight team has had in India. I mean, I know you are all so accomplished and have so much information to cover. Uh, this is just touching the service, surface here. So um, I really appreciate uh, being your being sensitive to the time. Um, so for the audience, I encourage you to go through the links and pursue their studies further. There's a lot to cover. So um, the, uh, we're gonna give each of the panelists a chance uh, to answer each of these questions. Um, let's see, these are the prepared questions first and then we'll be able to cover the audience questions. Um, let's see, the first question, Dr. Labrique and Dr. Nair has, says, um, has said that we all know that there's still gendered digital divide around mobile phone ownership and use, especially in low and middle income countries. What strategies are your teams using to address this? And what are your suggestions for improving the gender inequity for the future? So let's see, we'll start with Krishna, then Divya, and then give uh, Alana a chance. So, uh, Krishna, do you think you can answer this first and then we'll take our turn? Thanks, June. Um, I, I think, you know, for Medic, it, it, the, the proximal solution is to empower and, and uh, uh, supply community health workers and their supervisors with 
mobile phones. We have a donation program as well as ongoing efforts to work with uh, governments and ministries of health to include a budget line for hardware and software, something that isn't always done in every country. Um, when it comes to direct to client messaging or direct to family messaging and two-way texting, or all of the things that Divya and, and Alan mentioned in terms of uh, um, ownership versus access need to be considered. Uh, that is something that I think is, is, is uh, challenging for any one organization to solve for in and of themselves, but the more you're able to uh, provide uh, equitable access to connectivity and the more you're able to provide access to smartphones, I think you're able to significantly step up the kinds of uh, tasks and, and communications that you can then deploy. So starting out with uh, providing uh, community health workers, it's an ongoing issue for us because a frequent ask we get is, can you provide hardware? And we come back and say, do you have a budget for it? And our donation program helps a little bit, but not nearly enough. Thank you. Thanks. Um, let's see, Divya? Yeah, I feel like I covered quite a bit of this, but uh, you know, I think it's really uh, important to be context specific. Um, and I think, yeah, if you are able to provide the phones and actually there's quite a bit of that uh, work going on, that's great. Uh, but then there's always the problem of, you know, getting phone top up and um, all those issues and, you know, the sustainability of it is, is hard. Um, and then uh, once they've gotten the phone, then making sure that they have access and use. And it's great that, uh, you know, just working on the use piece is, uh, is really important. Uh, that's something that we've found also is that, uh, you know, digital literacy, even for educated women, for example, we've done an experiment with migrant workers garment, uh, from garment uh, factories. And we were trying to help them to provide remittances uh, back home and they really preferred in person even after we trained them and the reason was um, you know many fold but including lack of um, you know uh, familiarity with uh, with uh, digital though I would also highlight that there's a lot of potential there and you know the problem in that in our case was that uh, some of the back end uh, you know connections are not there in terms of uh, uh, you know, making sure that the the money is reaching who they want. They, uh, some of the the bank uh, connections and all were also problematic. Okay, so just ownership is not enough. So, uh, Alan. Yeah, so I think some some aspects of this gap are being bridged fairly rapidly, but the data, as you've heard this morning, suggests that there's there's still a lot of heterogeneity, even across parts of South Asia. Um, but I think I think intentional investment in women's phone ownership that includes, say, private sector partnerships that that maybe offer um, discounted plans to specific segments of society, or or the inclusion of of prepaid or subsidized phones as part of a healthy family or, or safe birthing kit would be would be incredibly exciting. Um, you know, the technologies that are becoming more and more affordable, where, where the phone itself, if you look at India's uh, geo uh, company as a, as a model, um, the phone itself is not as much of the revenue model for, for the network operators as the services and goods that flow through the technologies are. So I think there's, there's room for innovative public-private partnerships that can tr begin to address some of these uh, persistent uh, technology gaps. Great, thank you. Um, lessons learned here for uh, someone who comes from the operator side. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, I think Dr. Nair covered some of this, but the next question, uh, true data equity requires us to elevate voices of underrepresented populations and highlight not only their individual challenges, assets and aspirations, but also move beyond the individuals to the societal structures that shape their experiences. What are some steps we can take to go beyond disaggregation by sex and move closer to gender equity when we're talking about technology and health data collection. So let's see, this time we'll start with Divya, then Krishna and Alan. Sure. Um, yeah, when you're talking about health data, one of the uh, 
you know, I feel one of the pieces that we can address is the measures that we're collecting, right? Because apart from disaggregating indicators that we already have, um, we can actually collect new different data also. Um, and this is something that, you know, there's been quite a lot of discussion about in India. Uh, an example is, for example, uh, how, if, depending on who you ask in the household, uh, you will get different estimates of female employment, right? Because very often men and women don't value the kind of work that a woman is doing within the household. And so, you know, trying to measure that is challenging and it is something that needs to be done so that then, you know, once you basically what gets measured gets valued. And so really kind of thinking about the kinds of measures that we're using is uh, essential. That's one. Um, and then the other is uh, what we found is making sure that you're asking the right person the right question. Because very often uh, we ask questions about the household to men and, you know, they don't have or women, and, they, uh, and since men are picking up the phone more often, men might not be able to represent the household as well for certain kinds of questions. Uh, whereas women, for example, what we found is when we asked women about fertilizer use, they, they basically said they don't know for a lot of questions. Whereas men, for example, when you're asking them about price of something uh, of milk, then we got different answers for men, from men and women. So really thinking about, you know, who you're asking the question to, what the question is, and then thinking, talking about disaggregation, et cetera, is uh, useful. Great, thank you. Krista. Yeah, uh, uh, I think, you know, maybe drawing from, from work I did while at the Gates Foundation on social norms in particular, uh, that is an area that very rarely is linked explicitly to health interventions mm -hmm. uh, in a way that that they then inform uh, the design of health intervention. So I think, you know, really looking at uh, when you're doing user-centered research, are you being intentional about including voices, um, especially the voices of those we seek to serve or the voices of underrepresented constituents like CHWs. Um, when you're looking at um, the actual um, collection and use of the data, are you being ethical and thoughtful in, in considering responsible data collection in ideally going above and beyond as it comes to data privacy and confidentiality? I think those are all areas that, we, that are linked to um, an era in which you know, we, we, we see reports just recently in ICT works of surveillance uh, by, by governments. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do think we need to be very mindful of um, both socioeconomic vulnerabilities as well as other vulnerabilities for marginalized, criminalized and other populations. I've done a lot of work in the HIV space and the SRHR space. And for both of those, I can say that, you know, it, it is really, really important to think about a health and human rights grounding in everything we do. Uh, so, so I think bringing all of that into the work that that we do and the, the design of digital tools and the collection, uh, we've currently got uh, an interesting experiment underway with a couple of our implementing partners on informed consent, the the understanding of consent, the understanding of of and and consent to collect things like uh, uh, um, uh, geo geocodes and things like that, Any anything that could potentially end up becoming a proxy for a personal identifier. And I think we need to continue to be very mindful of the unintended negative consequences that could come from that. Thank you. A lot to consider. Uh, Alain? Yeah, so so I think as, as both uh, my previous colleagues have, have pointed out, intentionality is the key word that, that I think is important here, that we move into these projects, learning from what is known in the field and what others have experienced, um, combined with robust and inclusive formative work that listens to the voices of the, the marginalized groups. Uh, we have to make sure that their concerns and expectations are being met. And as Divya and Krishna have both said, uh, are we asking the right questions? I think we can also include things like real-time analysis of the data, looking at, at gender-specific indicators while projects are running um, to try and uncover important course corrections that need to be made early in a project uh, lifespan. Um, one thing that I was remarking, you know, Divya and I have both found 
uh, is this Im importance of cultural context, right? Recognizing gatekeepers, um, recognizing culturally appropriate genders for interviewers is really, really critical. And, and if these are not considered uh, appropriately, the consequences can actually be quite harmful. And, and so I think, uh, you know, we have to go forward with, with intentionality and, and careful planning to make sure we, we do this right. So intentionality, customization, inclusivity, and sensitivity, I think. Um, which leads us to the next question. What are some lessons learned from your work integrating gender equity in mobile data collection? The data for health partners can take I'm sorry, the data for health partners can take with them as they collect household data via mobile devices around non-communicable diseases, risk factors for diseases such as cancer and heart disease. I think this is perfect for um, a start with Alan to answer. So thanks for that, June. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, it's again critical to do the robust formative research to understand the population barriers and enablers uh, that we have to in include into these data collection programs around NCDs and then the, the digital health interventions that form around that, that, uh, that ground research. Um, with non-communicable diseases, I think it's really critical that we understand local context, local terminologies that, that are often used to describe different diseases in, in different parts of the world, right? So um, social stigmas, uh, constructs around disease and health uh, that, that modify the way people uh, view and, and are able to speak about risk factors, right? Just now we were talking about uh, knowledge uh, compartmentalization between husbands and, and, and wives, but similarly, there, there are social constructs that we need to understand about how people talk about non-communicable diseases and the experiences of disease um, that have to be understood when we design these, uh, these programs. So further intentionality. Great, thank you. Divya. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I don't have much more to add on this, but um, one piece that Alain mentioned that I thought resonated was also looking at the administrative data that uh, on the back end, in terms of who's answering, when they drop off, uh, why, um, you know, those pieces also would be, uh, could provide really, um, you know, important insights. Uh, so going beyond, uh, basically looking at the metadata in many ways. And then uh, in terms of the phone surveys themselves is, uh, yeah, just keeping in mind all these things in terms of who's getting excluded. Um, and, you know, finally, in terms of ending, I do want to say that it's a great opportunity to uh, like mobile technology to reach people, especially when they're sick in their house. Um, you know, that's the positive here is that it's, um, you know, there's a lot of optimism, but we just need to be cautious uh, um, in terms of who we might be missing while, while using the technology. Great, thank you. Krishna. Thank you. You're just building on, on the responses that, uh, that Alan and, and Divya have provided. I think when we're looking at universal health coverage at this point in time, one lesson learned is that there still is a gap from between intent and execution. And we continue to see data collection, including through mobile, in ways that are fairly siloed. Um, and that is often driven by where the donor funding is coming from. I think we're getting better at doing it. And yet tracking NCDs in any kind of uh, uh, meaningful way, if you compare with, let's say, immunization data, which are generally held up as, as one kind of, especially pediatric immunization data, which are held up as um, an exemplar, if you will, although they, they also have holes. I, I, I think we could agree that there still is a pretty big gap in, 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 in collecting data for NCDs. So first and foremost, I would say, take a look at harmonized and standardized indicators to Divya's earlier point, like, you know, and, and, and at least start measuring. Once you start measuring, you start getting the data. You can then ask the question, is there a gender differential here or not? Um, if there is, then, you know, clearly we need to do something about it. So that's, that's just one very basic and seemingly mundane thing that we can do in the here and now. Who funds the collection of those data has still not been clearly answered in our space. And I think it's a really important uh, question to ask. Uh, having worked in 
cervical cancer prevention and treatment, uh, I've struggled mightily to, to, to get resources to address uh, you know, some of these. And hypertension, diabetes, uh, eminently treatable, affordable, very high cost effectiveness, and yet um, we're not really doing anything meaningful. Uh, the other side of it is you know, interoperability, um, standardization again, harmonization again, and again, so seemingly mundane things, but quite challenging to implement. If you're looking at any chronic disease, you're looking at the need for a continuum of care. We recently proved with our partners Musso in Mali that you can, in fact, for universal health coverage, uh, improve coverage uh, and continuity over a brief period of time. So this was sort of, you know, a couple of months at a time. We're now running experiments to see if we can expand to the entire antenatal care and perinatal continuum, so up to six weeks postpartum. If you can provide that level of continuum of care in the community, that's a huge start because many of these, these, these conditions can be dealt with um, in the community. Uh, at some point in time, you will need to refer, and that is where you need the interoperability with electronic medical records. And that's an area that, again, we're beginning to work on. Thank you so much. And thank you, panelists, for all of your insight. I know you have much, much, much more you want to say. So I really appreciate your discipline and sensitivity so far. Thank you. Um, so now we, we already have questions from the audience. Um, so let's see, this is the first audience question for Krishna and Alan. I noticed both Medic and the Maternal Child Project in Bangladesh had many female community health workers. This is in itself a form of gender equity. What are your tips for hiring and supporting female data collection collectors? Uh, so Krishna, can we start with you? Sure, um, a, a, a topic very, very dear to my heart. Um, I would say that while the vast majority of frontline health workers are women and community health workers are women, they are not necessarily appropriately compensated, remunerated and represented in policy making and in execution. So that is one area. The second is we don't really have a, uh, in many countries, up to date and current community health worker registries to help us understand who these very valued frontline health workers actually are, what their qualifications, et cetera, are. And, and so, you know, we, there is still a lot of work to be done in terms of just representation, voice, remuneration, and fairness. And it's actually a fairly inequitable position right now that, that many of these workforces find themselves in. Um, uh, so I feel that that with that comes you know a great deal of opportunity to 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 address some of these these issues. Um, in every instance that I remember very early when sort of you know smartphones were first you know getting into more widespread use, there was an assumption that community health workers would not be able to use them somehow or apply them and in, in pretty much universally every single training that I've been part of directly and that any colleague whom I've asked, you know, the, the speed of adoption and agility is, is phenomenal. And um, I, I think you're all probably also aware as a physician, I feel okay saying this, sometimes you, you find that, uh, that, you know, uh, uh, community health workers and, and nurses um, have a narrower no-do gap in executing against a given clinical protocol than even physicians. And so coming at it with deep respect for their potential and their abilities and their intellect, I think is a starting point that, that, that we can really look at from, from how we show up. Um, I'll stop there and pass it on to Alan. Thank you. Uh, um, what a rich question. I think... Yeah. Um, you know, from, from uh, the research workers that, that we actively employ, we had control over and, and could, we could act, actively seek out and engage women who are living in and interested in serving their communities. But, but still, there was, there was at least a year of, of community norms shaping engagement and dialogue with community leadership especially in instances where the community health worker had to navigate their, their areas on bicycles. 
which raised a whole series of questions and challenges because it was considered, uh, you know, culturally novel and, and potentially unacceptable in, in certain conservative uh, uh, areas. But, but I think, you know, sticking with it and, and challenging some of these, uh, these, these gender restrictive norms is, is something that, that's, um, that's necessary. Getting the buy-in of community leadership to, to move, uh, move these things forward. I think from the government health worker point of view, as Krishna points out, right, it, it's, um, there, there's a, a justice a component to this because women are, are intentionally recruited into these positions because the, the, the priorities are usually reproductive health needs. And so as, as Divya pointed out earlier, you know, the access to families, access to pregnant women is usually limited to other women. And so having a male worker wouldn't, uh, wouldn't work out. Um, but that said, uh, there is a disproportionate gap in supervisory leadership that are that are women. So you end up with armies of frontline workers who are women, governed by supervisors who are men, and and uh, decision makers and policy makers who are largely men. And so, so one of the things I think that really needs active uh, advocacy and intentionality is persistently recruiting leaders. Who are who are of these large armies of frontline workers who are women, um, and and really supporting them in that in those positions and making sure they have the tools they need to succeed. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, question number two. Another way to include communities is to share survey results. Can you provide an example of when and how you have done that? Uh, let's see, can we have Divya first um, and then Alain and perhaps so, Krishna? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd say that we're still figuring this one out. Uh, but what we have uh, been, you know, experimenting with is basically um, texting back, like, uh, you know, the main results. Uh, and also uh, during COVID, we, you know, made uh, attractive little um, kind of flyers that we, so it was a, a GIF or, you know, so it, it was easy for, uh, for them to receive. Um, and also something that they didn't have to read too much, you know, that you, they didn't, uh, it was just a, a quick takeaway. So that was during COVID. And also there was a sense of urgency. We were trying to get information back, but you know, um, this is an area that we really have been thinking deeply about. And I, yeah, I will be happy to share later results once we figure this out better. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, I, I think I, I agree with Divya. This is a this is a constantly evolving area of innovation. Um, typically, you know, as as public health has evolved as a field, um, we've become better at the implementation science that's necessary to to translate research findings into policy. And a big part of that is is once results are known holding level, holding meetings at every level of, of the community from, from the community that was involved in the, the programs um, all the way through to policymakers uh, to provide that feedback of, of what were the key findings and, and what does this mean for that community going forward. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of seg segmenting of the target audiences. Um, with different messages, right? What, what are the messages that are of value and important to different uh, groups within the community, whether it's the decision makers, policy makers, or the households themselves who have contributed to the programs? Um, but I think, I think one of the things that's rapidly changing, you know, you saw the figure I shared with 95% household phone ownership. And during the pandemic, you know, in India, in Bangladesh, we've seen the role of, of social networks in spreading information and misinformation, unfortunately. So, so can we leverage these social networks, uh, WhatsApp chat groups and things like that to share things like infographics, to share bulleted key messages, take home messages, uh, videos, animations, right? That, that, that really encapsulate what we want to share back to the communities and help that go viral. Right. And there, there are communities that, that there are examples of work like, uh, like BBC Media Action has been doing in India, 
creating content and helping that content spread virally through uh, populations about reproductive and, and, and women's health. So, um, you know, I think, I think there's, there's a lot of scope for innovation as we, we move forward. Thank you. Um, Krishna, did you have something to add or we can go to the... Uh, sure, I'll, I'll try and be brief. I think, you know, our, our uh, primary audience and collaborator is the community health worker themselves. So uh, in that sense, you know, they are actively involved in co-creating uh, the, the, the tool or the intervention. And we, we also partner very closely with implementing partners such as Muso, Last Mile Health, Living Goods, Partners in Health, etc. Um, and um, we we know from the, from our work with with those implementing partners as well as with with ministries of health and with local health agencies that there is ongoing communication with those community health workers. Um, uh, it, it can always be improved. I think to Alan's point, like uh, until they are in supervisory positions more, it, it becomes a little bit difficult to sort of have the voice and the agency to say, this is what we need or this is what we want to do. So that really does need to be addressed. In terms of, of getting information back to the household level, that is the power of digital tools. You're able to you know, follow up, you're able to show up. And if you're looking at universal health coverage and the pilot we did with the, the, the RCT that we did with Muso in Mali, where you know, we were able to sort of increase uh, household visits and, and timeliness of visits, that is where you should be having a respectful conversation with the household uh, representative with whom you're speaking. Oftentimes it is the, the, the mom or the, the, the mother or the, late, the, the woman, and to be able to sort of you know, continue to keep them abreast of, of where their family's well-being is at that point in time and what steps can need to be taken and what support they can expect to receive. I think one really important missing piece in all of this is, again, lots of rhetoric about universal health coverage and yet continued very high out-of-pocket expenditure. And so also solving for that side of, of the equation, uh, which is how, how to make healthcare more affordable, uh, says a newly minted American sitting in Seattle, is, is really, really important. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we get to the very last question. The time flies with so much information to cover. Um, can you provide more details on gender inclusive design for digital data collection? Let me repeat that. Can you provide more details on gender inclusive design for digital data collection? Uh, let's see, we can start with um, uh, Krishna and Divya and Alan. Thank you. Um, so I, I think, you know, I, I partially answered this in my, in my last response, but what I will say is in thinking about the design, you also need to take into consideration safety and security of uh, data collectors um, um, when they are women. We know that that is a pervasive and ongoing issue. And uh, I think that is something that we tend to forget in the excitement about sort of engaging with in, in our daily life sort of community health workers, right? Sometimes it's, it's very easy to get into the design interface and the user-centered design. That's typically very inspiring, very engaging, very high energy. And then some of the practicalities of how it gets rolled out and, you know, should we also be building for some way to create alerts where there are issues um, related to safety and security? Should we also be thinking about other things that, that are experienced outside of the actual act of data collection that we would want to be considered for ourselves? Uh, uh, so do unto others, really as you would wish to be done to yourself, I think is, 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 is something that, that can be improved in, in, in design research. MEDIC itself sort of fundamentally uses a participatory methods for every single step of the way. Um, and then we hand over the work that we've done to our implementing partners and ministries of health, and they then do the execution. So I think there's a really important sort of connection that needs to be made and ongoing engagement between technology partners, if you will, and the, 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 the types of organizations that actually do the execution that are actually working with community health workers to cover households and to cover communities. So, and that link needs to be maintained and strengthened. 
Thank you. Divya? Yeah, I think it's important to keep this in mind during the design, um, you know, going back to the, the constructs that you're measuring and then the data collection as uh, Krishna was mentioning. Um, I think, you know, one, I, I'm not sure exactly what the question was uh, referring to, but, you know, also kind of uh, uh, capturing gender, like gender diversity in the sense that, you know, making sure that it's not only uh, binary that we're looking at mm -hmm. and that, you know, uh, especially when we're looking at respondents, um, you know, that they have an option to choose more that, and similarly, when we are disaggregating data, the, you know, we are able to reflect of the variety of experiences of all genders. I think that's also important. And that's really not happening. Um, and it's, I think, like I can say that uh, some of our partners did try this during, on the phone during the COVID surveys and they got very little, like very low responses. Um, so I think we need to kind of, again, work more in terms of, uh, you know, reflecting gender diverse experiences. But it is something that I hope is on our is on everybody's agenda. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, so so I think that both both uh, my colleagues here have have said a lot to to elucidate this this question. I think the only thing I'll add is is um, that you know question the question, right? So so ask as you're designing data collection uh, instruments and and uh, and and digital data capture. Um, why are we asking certain things? Where, how can we in, integrate uh, a gender lens into those questions? But I think one of the things we've done extensively in this uh, data for health work that we've been doing is doing cognitive testing. So actually bringing in um, different segments of our target audience. And as part of the formative work, uh, pre-testing a lot of the questions to make sure that they're you know, to, to understand how those questions are, are understood, how the intentions of the questions are interpreted. Um, is there a way that we can phrase the question to make it more, more articulate or clear, um, or even address, you know, biases that might be hidden to us, but obvious to the, the audience uh, that we're targeting. So, so you know, th there's, there's often not enough um, formative homework that, that is done before some of these projects and data collection instruments go live. And I think it's a, it's a relationship uh, with the funder of the work to make sure that adequate time and, and energy is budgeted for and allowed um, to really get it right. And, and getting it, there's no, there's no uh, expense that should be spared to get it right. And, and especially if we're prioritizing uh, this important aspect of our work. Thank you. Um, you know, I know there are many, many, many more questions from the audience and so much more to cover. I wish we had much more time um, together. We saw many nodding heads while we were, you know, people, the panelists were speaking. So um, as someone who's historically been there from the very beginning, it's just incredible to see the advance, advancement that we've made through digital. Um, you know, first it was um, a surprise in mobile money, then it was mobile health, and now it's um, mobile data collection and, you know, many more surprises to see from the work that you are all doing. And I am so thankful for the advancement that you've um, been able to achieve together through your incredible work. This field is very, very dense. It's hard to kind of digest, but you've been really helpful with that today. So thank you, uh, Dr. Labrik and uh, Dr. Nair and Dr. Uh, Jaffa. Um, for all of your insights today. I now pass the baton on to Dr. Kaufman. Thanks again. Thank you, Jim. And thank you again to our panelists. Um, some very practical advice. I appreciated that. Um, thank you to the audience for your thoughtful questions. We hope today's seminar has started you thinking about integrating gender equity into your own mobile health data collection in new and insightful ways. We are asking that Data for Health partners spend the next few minutes taking a brief knowledge check on the materials that were presented today. 
This will qualify you for a gender equity certificate at the end of the seminar series. The knowledge check is offered in French, Portuguese, Spanish, and English. You can scan the QR code in the slides on the screen or use the link in the chat. The Zoom webinar will stay open for the next 10 minutes in case you have any problems accessing the knowledge check. Uh, but we hope to see you in two weeks on Wednesday, the 6th of April at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, that's 1 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, for the next seminar in the series, Gender Equity in Health Data Analysis. Thank you all.